Thank you, and uh, good morning to everyone here. I must say I was uh, a bit struck by that uh, amazing video that the kids have put together this morning. Congratulations to those of you who've done that. Um, I, I, I listened attentively to the commentary as well. I must say those are very kind adjectives. It's the kind of praise that my late father, whose birthday is today, would certainly have uh, appreciated, but only my mother would have believed. Anyway, uh, thank you. It's, it's clear when you see these introductions that you've, the people have looked you up on the internet. This is, this is what happens these days when you come to address a new audience. And the fact is that um, this can be a pretty dangerous pastime. You sometimes find yourself being introduced by things that you haven't actually done, but which they've seen on the internet. Not always the most reliable source, you know. However, this case, in this case, there was no mistake. I, I, I'm glad they kept it mercifully brief as well. I remember a friend of mine in New York used to not only look up speakers by what he could find on the internet about them, but he would look up their uh, ancestors, their deeds and misdeeds of parents and grandparents and uncles and aunts, and use them in his introduction. And in one case, he was going to introduce a speaker who had been electrocuted at Sing Sing Prison, you know, in the electric chair for kidnapping and armed robbery or something equally horrible. But having taken the trouble to look this up, he felt he had to use it. So he said, uh, you know, our distinguished speaker had an uncle who occupied the chair of applied electricity in one of the nation's leading institutions. Which is just my way of saying that, uh, that uh, these introductions should be taken with a pinch of salt, but thank you very much, nonetheless, for the kind words. The fact that we are gathered here today in this very impressive uh, indoor stadium, or should I say indoor stadium, I'm not sure, uh, uh, is, is in some ways um, a tribute to the persistent impact of globalization. Uh, global leadership in turbulent times is what our organizers want me to situate India in, and in some ways it's, it's fascinating to think that way because in fact here we are in the heartland of India and uh, we're thinking about the rest of the globe. Uh, in some ways even our most commonplace headlines in the most routine matters reek of globalization. Not just the, the front page headlines on world affairs but I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago there was the headlines all over the newspapers about the 10th anniversary of the tragic demise of Princess Diana. Do you remember that? Well, you may ask, what's that got to do with globalization? Think of it this way. An English princess with a Welsh title leaves a French hotel with her Egyptian companion, who has supplanted a Pakistani. She's driven in a German car with a Dutch engine by a Belgian chauffeur full of Scottish whiskey. They are chased by Italian paparazzi on Japanese motorcycles into a Swiss built tunnel where they crash. A rescue is briefly attempted by an American doctor using Brazilian medicines, and the story is now being told to an Indore by an Indian member of parliament from Tiruvananthapuram. There is globalization. Anyway, I think it's time to probably get a bit serious on a, on a Saturday morning, but, um, but as you look towards the broader themes of this two-day conclave, um, and we think in terms of what are the major changes taking place in the world today before we get to focus on India's leadership role, if that is the right term, and I'll come to that. Um, we should probably talk a little bit about emerging markets because that's the biggest feature of uh, the recent changes in the way in which the world has, has been functioning. And the fact is that um, the very term emerging markets actually started off as a marketing phrase when a gentleman in America uh, was trying to interest investors in what he called rashly a third world equity fund. And of course, he found no takers. The third world suggested stagnation, poverty, depression. And uh, then he decided to come up with the term emerging markets equity fund. And that, of course, was oversubscribed because emerging markets suggested positive forward movement and, and dynamism and, and change. But in some ways, he had stumbled across the right sort of thing because in many ways, there have been a huge amount of changes in these emerging markets. 
And while it's been very difficult to find an agreed definition, and those of you who are studying management will probably be able to Google everything from the IMF to the Morgan Stanley definition and Emerging Markets Index to The Economist magazine. Everybody has a different take. There's even a political analyst who's described an emerging market as a country where politics matters at least as much as economics to market outcomes, which uh, is another way of looking at it. But definitions should not detain us too long. In fact, um, in my UN days, which have been mentioned, um, I, I, I remember a, an argument, perhaps an apocryphal one, between an American diplomat and a French diplomat in which the American diplomat says, you know how we can solve this problem? We can do this and this and this and we can solve it. And the French diplomat says, yes, 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 that will work in practice, but will it work in theory? I bet that sounds like some of your management professors, right? And the fact is that um, it doesn't matter that we don't have an agreed theoretical definition. What's striking is that all these definitions will still give you a list of some 28 to 33 countries around the world, which vary hugely in size, in growth rates, in political environment, and in per capita GDP. Alphabetically from Argentina to Vietnam, but embracing such different places as China and Mexico, India and Hungary. Now, if you had to issue a checklist of criteria for what's happening uh, around the world with these emerging markets, I would say very quickly that the emerging markets will fulfill these criteria. Economies that were not in the past deemed to be amongst the developed or first world countries, but were rather seen as low or middle income countries. Economies that are still experiencing sufficient growth now to be considered, considered as transitioning to eventual developed country status, though they're not there yet. Economies previously characterized by high levels of poverty and underdevelopment, which are being overcome to a greater or lesser extent through market-oriented reforms. And then finally, and this is where it gets a little more complicated, economies undergoing political change of various kinds, and there are various examples given the transition from communism in the countries of Eastern Europe, Vietnam, the transition from other forms of autocracy, like the Philippines, South Africa with its apartheid system, South Korea, General's Rule, or well-established democracies in times of turbulence, India and Brazil. But in all of this, China is considered the great exception because it's a country where political transformation seems minimal while economic growth is impressive. But it may be instructive, though, for the Chinese to realize that just a year ago, if you were drawing up this category, this list of countries in this category, you would have included Egypt and Tunisia as two countries where there was no political change but a lot of economic growth. So history and politics have a habit of surprising us, and the Chinese should not be totally complacent. Now, I should add, since you're, the majority of you here are students, uh, and I should try and give you some up-to-date gyan that the fact is that this term is probably beginning to near the end of its useful shelf life. The whole term of emerging markets is slowly becoming a little passé, not just because President Obama came and stood in our parliament and said, you're not an emerging market, you already emerged, which is flattering but probably not entirely true. Uh, the fact still is that the phenomenon of emergence it just is too loose, too, too broad a, a category uh, uh, to be useful as a, either an analytical device or as an investment device. And so people want to focus on a more select list. And the most famous one was when Goldman Sachs in 2003 came up with the term BRIC to cover Brazil, Russia, India, and China, and then forecast the success and prosperity of these countries eight years ago. Uh, in fact, it must be the only international gathering actually invented by an investment firm on Wall Street, because the leaders of the four BRIC countries then started taking it seriously, meeting together, and finally they became such an influential group that the South Africans wanted to join the party, and BRIC has now become BRICS. And if you go into the, the theory, as we were joking about earlier, you will find someone to add Mexico and make it BRIMC, and someone to make it unpronounceable by adding Turkey for it with a T. But let's forget all of that for now and just look at the four BRIC countries, the original BRIC countries, in the Goldman Sachs list. And you're looking at four countries which are likely collectively to overtake the original G7. The original G7 were the seven largest economies in the world. And they're likely to overtake them by 2040. So that is an extraordinary thing. Four countries that would not even have got a, an invitation <coughs> to the waiting room, as it were, outside the... Uh, 
<coughs> outside the original G7 meeting will now overtake them all collectively by 2040. Now that's for the speculative future, of course, but right now these countries already account for about 30% of global growth. They attract some 20% of the world's total foreign direct investment. Uh, 